Good afternoon. Calling to order the House Committee on Co uh, Consumer Protection and Commerce. It is uh, February 9th, 2.04 p.m. We are in room 329. Uh, first, before we begin, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to the chair, uh, and we look forward to a productive session uh, under his leadership. Uh, now for some housekeeping. Uh, for those who are testifying, we'd like to limit your testimony to two minutes so that we could fit everyone in. Uh, for those who are on Zoom, if you do have technical difficulties, you could always contact the IT staff through chat. Uh, and if we can't come to you, uh, we'll try to circle back to get your testimony later. First, House Bill 16 relating to liquor authorizes liquor licenses to sell unopened beer, wine, and prepackaged cocktails with food for pickup, delivery, takeout, or other means to be consumed off premises. Authorizes liquor licensees to hold class four retail dealer licenses to deliver purchased liquor to a customer's vehicle. First to testify on Zoom, we have Tina Yamaki from the Retail Merchants of Hawaii in support. Aloha Chair, and, um, Vice Chair and members of the committee, I'm Tina Yamaki with the Retail Merchants of Hawaii and we strongly support this measure. You know, during the pandemic, we saw that many of our customers' um, habits have changed a lot. They got used to online shopping and then coming curbside to pick it up. We're also seeing that this has carried over even today. And um, a lot of people still are doing that. They like the fact that they don't have to go inside. We have to remember the pandemic is not over yet. And um, retailers, like many other customer service industries, constantly evolving with the demands of our customer and curbside pickup is one of them. Um, we are seeing more people continue to order things like groceries, electronics, apparel, home goods, and lots, and it makes a lot of um, customers happy that they can just drive up, pop up the truck, get their groceries delivered in there. Um, and customers could enjoy the fact that they can still enjoy takeout meals with an adult beverage in their comfort of their own homes. Um, and being able to obtain their grocery and other shopping needs all in one stop and not having to go into the store is gonna really help them a lot. And this would include having unopened wine, beer, and mixed cocktails. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Collins, uh, Rick Collins from the Hawaii Public Health Institute uh, in opposition. Rick, are you there? He's present. Yeah, I'm going to keep my video off. But um, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Nakashima and. Vice Chair Sayama and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Rick Collins. I'm with the Hawaii Public Health Institute, and uh, our project under the Hawaii Public Health Institute is the Hawaii Alcohol Policy Alliance. And our alliances oppose this measure, um, generally because there's strong research evidence that um, supports that the increase of availability of alcohol in communities um, results in more consumption, um, which results ultimately in more alcohol-related uh, harms, uh, including things like violence um, and other harms in communities. And so uh, the World Health Organization, Centers for Disease Control, calls uh, restrictions on availability of alcohol uh, one of the top three best buys that um, we can do in communities to reduce alcohol-related harms. So I'll keep it at that. Um, we ask that you would oppose this bill, and we'll stand on the rest of our testimony. And I'm happy to ask, answer questions if anyone has any. Thank you for letting me provide some testimony. Thank you. Next, we have Garrett Marrero from the Maui Brewing Company in support. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stand on uh, my written testimony in strong support of this. You know, I, I think we have, uh, I'd like to add, uh, I think we've seen uh, this, the argument that um, access in terms of delivery and to go beverages. Uh, pre-COVID would have been world ending. Uh, COVID gave us a unique opportunity to test this theory. And uh, to be honest, you know, we did not see large increases in, uh, you know, some of the, the concerns that Mr. Collins and his uh, alliance have. Uh, in fact, I've, I've read up a lot on this issue and the, um, the way alcohol is either A, delivered uh, versus even to go pick up, IDs are still checked. There's processes in place to make sure that minors are not getting an increased alcohol 
uh, uh, increased access to alcohol. So uh, again, standing on the written testimony, um, you know, we're all trying to recover here from COVID. In, in the end of the day, this does just increase the ability for local beverage manufacturers as well as the retailers to support the clientele that aren't returning to the restaurants or to the food and beverage establishments in mass uh, and allow Mr. them to Mario, take a beverage to go summarize. Uh, and enjoy it from the safety of their home. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, are there any members present who wish to testify on this measure? Okay, so members, we do have a uh, comments uh, from the Liquor Commission, a supportive testimony from the Hawaii County Liquor Department, comments from the Kauai Department of, Kauai, uh, Department of Liquor Control, uh, as well as numerous uh, testimonies in support from Beer Lab Hawaii, Lanikai Brewing Company, Honolulu Beer Works Big Island <coughs> Brew House, LLC, uh, Kala Pavai Market and Cafes, Kauai Beer Company, Maui Chamber of Commerce, and that's all the testimony we have for this measure. Um, members, are there any questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 17 relating to liquor licenses. Uh, authorizes a county liquor commission to allow licensees to sell unopened beer, wine, and pack pre-packaged cocktails with food for pickup, delivery, takeout, or other means to be consumed off-premises. First to testify, we have Tina Yamaki from Retail Merchants of Hawaii in support. Aloha again, this is Tini Yamaki with Retail Merchants of Hawaii, and yes, we are in strong support of House Bill 17. This would allow um, the liquor, County Liquor Commissions um, to allow us to have curbside pickup again. Um, as in my previous um, testimony, it is something that is trending, and as a retailer, we need to keep up with the times and what the demands of our customers are. Mahalo. Thank you. Next, we have Garrett, Garrett uh, Marrero from Maui Brewing Company in opposition. Aloha again. Uh, it must be unique seeing my opposition uh, given my testimony on 16. Uh, you know, the reason for that is, uh, A, we believe the liquor commissions already have the authority to, to make this, uh, to approve the ability for to-go beverages. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, the more tools that liquor commission does have that require more burden on not only on their system to approve a permit, but then the conditions that could be placed in every county being different. Uh, you know, I guess just a matter of the bureaucracy involved in it that we would oppose this. Um, that being said, we strongly encourage a discussion with the various departments to work within our industry to, to find a streamlined system that can be universally applied across the state to make said system uh, efficient. Uh, and for only those reasons do we oppose it, but we of course support the idea of to-go beverages. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Rick Collins from the Hawaii Public Health Institute in opposition. Yeah, hello, Rick Collins, uh, again, providing testimony on uh, this bill in opposition. I'm, I'm just um, I'm grateful, Garrett, that we uh, are in opposition together on something or are together on something. So sorry for the side comment there. We'll stand on our testimony of oppos uh, opposition to the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Any other persons here uh, to testify on this measure? Okay, members, we have comments from the Honolulu Liquor Commission, support from the Hawaii County Liquor Department, opposition from Monokai Brewing Company, opposition from Honolulu Beer Works, opposition from Big Island Brew House, LLC, supportive testimony from Kala Pavai Market and Cafes, and Maui Chamber of Commerce. Members, any questions? Oh, go ahead, Representative Pierre. Um, this question is for Maui County. Is Maui County here? I don't believe they're here. Is that correct? Okay. okay, yeah, they're not here. Not. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, members, we'll be moving on to HB 159 relating to liquor licenses. It eliminates the notarization requirement regarding applications for renewals of and transfers of liquor licenses. First to testify on this measure, we have Garrett Marrero from Maui Brewing Company in support. 
Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, again. Um, thank you, too, for consolidating these bills. Um, and Rick, uh, we're on board more than you think. Uh, we can talk about that offline. Uh, we support this. Uh, you know, it is an onerous task to get a liquor license uh, in this state, uh, each county being very different. Oftentimes, applications are rejected for something as simple as a comma. Uh, if that's out of place and you've notarized it and God forbid you're out of state. Uh, I've see, uh, individually, I've spent more than $200 in notary fees and next day shipping just to get a single page through uh, for processing. Uh, this streamlines the process. Um, there are many intervals in which a liquor enforcement or liquor license application intake officer uh, has to verify that that person in front of them is indeed that person and uh, executing those documents of their own free will, which is the purpose of a notary. So uh, for those reasons, uh, I believe taking away and making it easier for business owners to conduct business uh, would be more friendly. And for those reasons, we support this uh, elimination of notary requirement. Thank you. Thank you. Any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, members, we have written testimony with comments from the Honolulu Liquor Commission and support from the Hawaii County Liquor Department, support from Lani Kai Brewing Company, support from Honolulu Beer Works, support from Big Island Brew House, and uh, Zachary LaParade. Okay, members, any questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 596 relating to intoxicating liquor. Uh, requires the Liquor Commission to record all complaints against any licensee regardless of whether the complaint is filed during or after the occurrence of the violation. Requires the Liquor Commission to review the history of complaints against any applicant at the time of application for a new license or renewal of an existing license. First to testify on this measure we have, surprise, uh, Mr. Garrett Marrero from the Maui Brewing Company <laughs> in opposition. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, we oppose this uh, just in the fact that uh, it, you know, a complaint is not a violation. Um, you know, requiring, uh, you know, keeping a file of it is one thing, but requiring its review in uh, issuing a new renewal or a new liquor license, uh, that can be very onerous in the fact that there's no timeline. It's the entire history. So a 30 year uh, restaurant licensee could have, you know, a handful of complaints over 30 years and in for that to count against them in a today world with a renewal with a new license application without due process or any interviews taking place to even verify said complaint because again that complaint can be either filed at the time of or at some arbitrary date it just leaves it open for uh, real problems and and tools that can be used against small businesses in our state i think we just need some common sense practices to make sure that those who qualify for licenses have licenses and to be fair uh, we saw a lot during covid of infighting between uh, licensees uh, calling each other out for one thing or another and this rule opens that up to be uh, used as a weapon against uh, others and i don't think that that's fair so for those reasons we oppose and again my written testimony contains for thank you uh, other persons here to testify on this measure okay members we have written testimony from the honolulu liquor commission with comments uh opposition uh testimony from the hawaii county liquor department beer lab hawaii honolulu beer works lani lani kai uh, brewing company big island brew house llc's uh two individuals and Kauai beer company members are there any questions Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 1084 relating to liquor. This increases the per wine gallon tax on alcoholic beverages. Uh, first to testify on this <coughs> measure, we have Gary Suganuma from the Department of Taxation with comments. Hello, Chair, Vice Chairman, for the Committee, David Richmond on behalf of the Department of Taxation. Uh, the Department stands on its written testimony and offering comments and I'm available for today. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Kenneth uh, Fink from the Hawaii State Department of Health in support. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair. Um, Department of Health stands on the testimony in support. Yes, uh, for any thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, for those who are viewing this virtually, uh, they stand in uh, Sorry, Department of Health stands in support uh, and stands on the written testimony. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Rick Collins from the Hawaii Public Health Institute in support. Okay, 
Okay. Uh, we'll move on then to Victor Lim from the Hawaii Restaurant Association in opposition. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Kashima, uh, Vice Chair Sayama, and members of the Committee on Consumer Protection and Commerce. The Hawaii Restaurant Association, representing 4,000 eating and drinking place locations here in Hawaii, strongly opposes HB 1084 that increased per one gallon tax on alcohol beverages. Even though no, we are now out of COVID-19, businesses continue to struggle in this high interest rate and high inflationary climate. Our consumer also face higher costs for everything that they buy, including utilities, gasoline, and so on. Our state coffers may be flush with cash, but our general citizenship is, is facing diminishing buying power. The high tax increases as proposed by this bill will further drive up the inflation index in these very difficult times. Thank you very much for giving us our opportunity to share our point of view. Thank Mahalo. you. Thank you, Victor. Next, we have Tina Yamaki from the Retail Merchants of Hawaii in opposition. Sorry, aloha and good afternoon again. I'm Tina Yamaki with the Retail Merchants of Hawaii, and we stand in opposition to this bill. Hawaii is already the second highest tax state just under California. Um, and if this measure is to, to deter people from drinking by raising the prices, it may deter people when they're going out you know, to have a beverage with their dinner or lunch or whatever it is. Um, but for purchasing, it's not because what's going to happen is we're going to see more and more people going to the military bases because they have friends or family buying it for them or they're going to go buy it on the black market. We are already seeing in our store shoplifters going after all types of alcoholic beverages. And for us, it's, you know, it's a loss and it's, it's just we just pass on the cost to the customers anyway, so it's not going to deter them from drinking. They're just going to find another way to do it. Um, and also to um, local businesses would be hurt from the lack of sales and the state would not be able to collect um, taxes if it is sold on the black market or through the military. Mahalo. Thank you. Next we have Tom Yamachika from Tax Foundation of Hawaii with comments. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Tom Yamachika from Tax Foundation. Um, we are concerned about the economic impacts, uh, and we will send our testimony and be available for questions. Thank you. Next we have Mihoko Ito from the Wine Institute in Opposition. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Mihoko Ito on behalf of the Wine, uh, in Wine Institute. Uh, we do stand uh, on our testimony in opposition, but I would just like to highlight a few things. Um, first of all, uh, this measure would actually result in the price of wine being the highest uh, in the country. Um, we agree with the other testifiers that um, now may not be the right time to be raising prices on everything in the light of the current inflationary environment. Um, the bar and restaurant industry in particular have been particularly hard hit um, as a result of the COVID pandemic. And these taxes tend to be um, regressive because they impact um, those in lower income brackets the most um, significantly. And one more thing to point out is this increase that's proposed in this bill is actually, it operates just like the excise tax does, which means that it operates within the three tier system uh, in which alcohol is distributed. It, uh, it uh, is imposed at every level, which actually inflates it even more. Um, so we just ac ask you to think about those impacts and defer this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Garrett Marrero from the Maui Brewing Company in opposition. Hello again. Uh, yes, in opposition for the same reasons uh, my colleagues are. Um, you know, number one, two that I'd like to point out is that being a regressive tax uh, does impact the lower income households more. Uh, second, in, in reality, it has the least effect. A tax increase has the least effect on beer consumption versus other commodities. So it's not really an effective way to curb that. Uh, you know, beyond that, we are experiencing in some cases 50 to 60 percent increases in cost of goods. So speaking from a local business standpoint, you know, if the taxes are go up, it's levied universally across beer or wine. So our local producers are going to be hit the hardest. These are the producers that are employing our neighbors, employing all Kamahaina and supporting the economy here, paying the taxes here. Um, you know, someone who maybe decides that a petition particular brand foreign produced imported from the mainland is cheaper than buying a local product 
the local businesses are going to see the biggest negative impacts from this and we're the ones that fought through covid to keep our people employed to make sure that we had uh, food and beverage establishments for people to enjoy safely so uh, now is certainly not the time and i would argue to go on record i want to pay more taxes and we're going to hear a bill here in a moment about how i can do that by being able to produce more it should be about growing businesses and working together to be able to find a way to help support this state but a tax increase will not have the impact intended and will only hurt local businesses thank you thank you are there any other persons here to testify on this measure Okay, members, we have testimonies, written testimonies in opposition from the Hawaii Liquor Wholesale <coughs> Association, Lani Kai Brewery Company, Honolulu Beer Works, Big Island Brew House, LLC, Anheuser Busch, Manuele Distilleries, LLC, Koei Beer Company, Brewers Association, <coughs> Mawson Coors, and Chamber of Commerce Hawaii. Uh, members, are there any questions? Sure. Representative Onishi. Yeah, for DOTAX. <coughs> Um, I had a question. Where does these, uh, the revenue from these taxes go? Does it go to the general fund? Uh, it is my understanding that it does. Okay, so there's no correlation between the added taxes and funding services or uh, treatment services, prevention services for alcohol abuse. That I do not know, but I may defer to the Department of Health if they have specific programs. But it is my understanding it does go directly to the general fund. Okay. Uh, if Chair, if I can have Department of Health. Go ahead. Come on. Thank you. Aloha, Representative. Hi. Thank you for being here. So my question is, <coughs> if the money goes into the general fund, how would the department try to secure these additional this additional revenue for the treatment uh, mental health prevention treatment services for alcohol abuse or alcohol related health and social impacts so um i'll have to check with our fiscal as to how we can do that if if it's going to the general funds so um so there is no plan for that at this point uh the it would i believe the admin bill says hth 907 but perhaps we would need to make an amendment to that so where to where it goes to the right program id our alcohol and drug abuse division is hth 440. okay S my um Follow-up question. Go ahead. So in the past, we've raised the taxes on alcohol. Do you folks have any data as to the impact in reducing consumption or the impact on adverse health and social impacts when we've done it before? As far as uh, state level data that's something I'm, I would need to get back with the committee on but as far as the um, national data according to the, the Centers for Disease Control from 2015 to 2019 there have been an annual average of over 500 deaths per year from alcohol related diseases so um, it's something that we could definitely take try to take a closer look at if we wanted more localized data um, this sort of this elk this tax increase actually happened before my time but um, this is something that perhaps we could take a further look and, and if need be we could take have some studies done okay so the 526 alcohol attributable deaths in Hawaii ranges all kinds of issues right including traffic accidents it could it could include those it could include chronic conditions or other uh, situ or, or, or yeah. other illnesses related to depending on the individual's do you folks health have the data on that uh, the figures that are available now are from the CDC so they're they're available publicly so I would have to yeah 
as far that that's from the CDC but as far as state level I would have to take a closer look and check in with our other DOH programs that have say toxic toxicological data on alcohol related deaths okay but you guys agree that the concept of raising these prices is to try to reduce but you don't have any data that correlates that the best right now that I could uh, uh, mention is just the, C the CDC data so we would need well, to take I a look at that. I understand that yeah. but like I said the Hawaii has raised alcohol taxes before so I mean I'm sure that argument was used before also you know that it would reduce consumption it would reduce uh, related services needed it would reduce debts so I'm interested in finding out was there a correlation you know so thank you if you okay uh, yeah thank you Chair. thank you so much thank you uh, any members have questions okay actually uh, I do have a follow-up on that you mentioned the program ID for substance abuse treatment in Department of Health is HTH 440 is that correct that's correct okay so what's the funding for this program where's that coming from for that, the that specific program ID is there funding for that program there is funding we receive uh, federal funds uh, block grant funds every year as well from our block grant standard block grant as well as other discretionary grants these are grants that are only here for a very short period of time one year two years four uh, years to your knowledge is there any alcohol or substance abuse treatment program on the department that's being funded by the state we have about a number of uh, about a dozen primary prevention programs that could reach out to young people who uh, who have uh, uh, probable substance use disorders um, as well as tr uh, about three dozen treatment contracts with treatment providers who can help uh, is say if they're if, if, if the addiction if they're their onset alcohol related use disorders then they could uh, work with them, do case management, and enroll them in different treatment programs, intensive outpatient, residential. Okay, thank you, I just wanted to clarify on that. And uh, I'd like to, again, reiterate from Representative Onishi's point, uh, if you could get data back to this committee regarding uh, any changes in the alcohol attributed deaths since I believe the last time this was, the it first tax was implemented was 1998. So if there was any changes before and after 1998. That may have come during the time when I started state government in another <laughs> office, uh, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. But yes, uh, I, I definitely hear the committee's uh, interest in seeing whether an evaluation was done and, and whether that's available. OK, thank you. Members, any other questions? I have a question. Oh, yes, go ahead. Is there, thank you, um, is there any effort to take some of these potential tax revenues and apply them towards fetal alcohol syndrome disorder? Thank you, Representative. That's a great question. Um, you know, uh, and I'll have to check with my departmental colleagues, uh, but yes, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is one of the side, uh, one of the effects, uh, as mentioned in my r our written remarks. Uh, it, uh, al uh, excessive drinking can lead to a whole host of issues. And so this is what we hope to try to prevent. And uh, the American Asso Society for Addiction Medicine has produced some recommendations. Um, they set the criteria uh, whereby we uh, enter folks into treatment. So it, it's medical criteria. And so they put a how out a list of uh, different options on how we could um, uh, reduce those overdose, uh, th those those alcohol-related deaths. Um, it's not, most of these recommendations aren't specific to one particular substance, but it could be alcohol, drugs, other drugs, that sort of thing. Okay. So the, the, the recommendations are kind of general, but um, there are a number of things that we could do. 
uh, we just have to, again, as the other committee members have suggested, take a deeper dive into <coughs> the data to see what percentage of those involve fetal alcohol Thank spectrum you. disorders. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 1458. Uh, this is relating to liquor licenses, increases the liquor manufacturing limits for class 18 small craft producer pub license holders. First to testify, we have Garrett Marrero from the Maui Brewing Company. Hello, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. This is, uh, I believe, my final one today. Um, we, we're in strong support. Uh, again, this is the situation that occurs um, you know, as we continue to grow this industry in Hawaii and support local businesses. Uh, you know, being able to raise those limits on how much beverage we can produce uh, will only serve to support the local business as well as increase the tax revenue to the state. So if we're looking for revenue generators, the way we generate revenue is by supporting the small businesses in being able to grow. Uh, and this bill does that. Uh, you know, in my testimony, I cover you know some of the reasoning behind the Class 18 existence and such. Uh, so I'll stand on that written testimony. Uh, but do believe uh, that we should strongly support this bill. And uh, you know, I would appreciate uh, any questions. I'd be happy to answer for you as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, members, we also have supported testimony from Lanikai Brewing Company, Honolulu Beer Works, Big Island Brew House, LLC, and Kauai Beer Company. Members, are there any questions? Chair? Say, oh, yes. Yeah, for Mr. Morero? Yes, sir. Yeah, what is your definition of a small craft producer? Yeah, that's a great question. Small is relative, right? Um, you know, we are the largest producer of beer in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, there's often a joke told that Budweiser spills more than we produce in a year. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say small if we go to the Brewers Association, which is the national trade guild that uh, represents America's small and independent craft brewers. Uh, that barrel is six million barrels a year. Uh, so currently the class 18 small craft producer is uh, limited to, I believe, 60,000 barrels. Uh, so we're talking about uh, one one hundredth of what the federal government defines small as. And the Brewers Association. Oh, but wait, you said they were small and independent brewers? Yes. Is the federal yes. standard? Uh, small and independent. Independent just has to do with ownership. I apologize. Um, you know, it, I work with the BA. I serve uh, on the board of directors there. And uh, as my volunteer work there, I, I think I sometimes get into the definition of representing America's small and independent craft brewers. So when we do talk about small breweries, we are talking about six million barrels or less. If we even go to the IRC, the tax code, uh, there is a, a carve out from two million and under considered micro. Uh, and so you would, again, 2 million barrels is far beyond what we could ever even produce here in Hawaii. Uh, so if we're looking at small, you know, raising this to 150,000 barrels is still very small by even those standards. We're talking 15 times smaller than what the Internal Revenue Code sets its first next threshold at. So last year, did you make 70,000 or... Yeah, 70,000 barrels. We did not. Uh, you know, our hope is that we continue to grow and that we do reach those those uh, those numbers, but we did not do that last year. Uh, where we're in danger is not only ourselves, but our, our colleagues at Kona Brewing Company over in Hawaii and others that are making significant investment in the state, like Honolulu Beer Works, Waikiki Brewing. They're continuing to grow. So as we push up against those limits, that limits our growth. And, um, you know, if I could give an anecdotal story going back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, actually now, when the barrelage limit was 5,000 barrels a year, that during Compared to today, I would be able to operate in the month of January and have to terminate all of my team members for the remaining 11 months because I would have been up against that limit. So, you know, we've been fortunate to be successful and to continue to grow and now employ nearly 700 people uh, in the state of Hawaii. But these limits are often asked why they exist and no good answer has ever been given. It's always the way it was. Why we want to limit what a local producer can make uh, is it, it escapes me for a good reason why we'd want to limit what we could produce and thereby limiting how much we'll pay in taxes. 
Um, well, just to let you know, none of your colleagues asked for this increase because they are hitting the limit. Um, I don't understand why the limit needs to be increased if nobody's hitting it. So, and uh, so, you know, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. If you guys were reaching the limit, say in November or even in September, it makes a lot of sense to be able to produce more because mm -hmm. you're selling more. But, you know, and Kona Brewery is brewing on the mainland now. So, you know, I don't know that they qualify as a, truly a Hawaii brewery or a small craft brewery. I can appreciate your comments, uh, I, I'm sure, uh, more than you know. Uh, however, you know, we do expect to come up against this limit uh, ourselves immediately. Uh, the problem is, is that we can't pick up the phone and say, hey, you know what, next month we're going to hit this limit, we need to change this. We are looking forward as we make investments in this county, in this state, uh, to give you the idea of what we've borrowed to be able to invest this year, uh, sorry, 2022. Our capital expenditure budget last year was about $8 million that we invested in the state to create jobs, to brew more efficiently, to pull carbon out of the air, to create solar energy, to be a green producer here. Uh, we are going to hit that 70,000 barrel mark within the next, I would say, 18 to 24 months. Uh, that would then require us to close down the distillery operations and no longer be able to make cider, which some of our gluten-free friends uh, really like to consume when they, they come to our establishments. So uh, we are being forward thinking. And uh, you know, I like to look back to 2005 when we started this company and there were six breweries in the state, uh, then there were four and now there are 30 because we've created an industry, we've created an environment that is more friendly to this cottage industry of craft brewing, craft distilling, and, and of course, craft cidery. So uh, we are just being, as we have been for the last 18 years now, uh, forward thinking and making sure that we don't come up against that limit and make sure that it moves out further before we get to this situation. Uh, I would hate to get to a point where we're at that limit and then have to go backwards and say, hey, sorry, we've got to stop producing because we're up against this limit. And that is exactly what we're facing within the next year to two years. God willing, this year. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Could I ask Dotax a question? Sure. I know they're here. If Dotax can come up. So you guys are responsible for collecting these taxes from the local breweries, correct? Yes. And that is based on how much is being produced, correct? I do apologize, Onishi. I don't know the technical side of how we're collecting that. Well, I mean, we just but had a bill be about the taxes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. I'm assuming it's it's based on production. Yes, production. Itself. So would you be able to furnish us a report of the local breweries and over say the past five years how much was produced uh, based upon these different categories uh, based on the taxes that they paid so that we can get an accurate uh, indication of what is being produced and what the need is so you know I mean 150 may not be sufficient for us to not have to review this every two, three years. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if you guys can help produce that, we'll definitely we'd appreciate that. it. We'll share you with the committee. can provide it to the chair. Yep. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, chair. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 24, HD 1, relating to water uh, common carriers. Removes the requirement that water common carriers secure prior, secure prior approval of the Public Utilities Commission to enter into long-term leases of more than three years and leverage leases. First to testify, we have Leo Askosian uh, from the Public Utilities Commission with comments. Aloha, good afternoon. Um, Chair Nakashima, Vice Chair Sayama, and members of the House Committee on Commerce, oh sorry, <laughs> Consumer Protection and Commerce Committee. Um, my name is Andrew Okabe. I am here on behalf of Chair Leo Sunshin for the Public Utilities Commission. We stand on a written 
testimony offering comments on HB 24 at HD 1 and we're available for any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dean Nishina from DCCA in opposition. Aloha and good afternoon, Chair Nakashima, Vice Chair Sayama, members of the committee, Dean Nishina with the Division of Consumer Advocacy. You have our written testimony in opposition. I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Chris Nakagawa from Young Brothers in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Chris Nakagawa on behalf of Young Brothers. Um, we'll stand on a, our um, strong support for, on a written testimony and available for any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, members, we also have written testimony in support from Matson's Navigation Company as well as Hoi Harbor Users Group. Members, any questions? Okay. Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 1029. This is relating to the use of electronic filing by the Public Utilities Commission. Authorizes the Public Utilities Commission to use electronic filing processes, including electronic service of documents to conform to the provisions of Chapter 269, 271, and 271G, Hawaii Revised Statutes and Current Practices. First to testify, we have uh, Public Utilities Commissions in support. Hi, Chair Nak Nakashima, Vice Chair Sayama, and members of the committee. My name again is Andrew Okabe. I'm here on behalf of Chair Le Leo Senshin from the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. We stand on our written testimony in strong support of this measure. Uh, we are, I'm here available for any questions your committee may have. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Dean Nishina from uh, DCCA in support. Aloha again, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Dean Nishina with the Division of Consumer Advocacy. We you have our written testimony, stand, in, um, stand on that written testimony in support of the measure, available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Chris Nakagawa from Young Brothers in support. Aloha, Chris Nakagawa again on behalf of Young Brothers. Um, we're also in strong support and stand our written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, members, we also have supportive testimony from uh, Hawaii Telecom. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 348. This is relating to renewable energy. This allows the counties to establish by ordinance an opt-in program that allows an annual payment in lieu of real property taxes on the land or improvements thereon that are actively used to produce or store renewable energy that is sold to an electric utility. First to testify, we have Maria Tome from Hawaii State Energy Office in support. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. You have our written testimony in strong support of this measure, and I am here to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Greg Shimokawa from, the Hawaii, from Hawaiian Electric in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Greg Shimokawa from Hawaiian Electric. Um, we stand on our written testimony in support of this measure and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Next, we have Tom Yamachika from the Tax Foundations of Hawaii with comments. Uh, thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Tom Yamachika from Tax Foundation. Uh, we're a little bit confused about this bill uh, because uh, the problem, as we understand it, is that you have some people who had built on ag land, uh, they put some solar panels on it, and the, uh, uh, and the county said, well, okay, well, that's, that's not ag land anymore, it's industrial, and they reassessed the property. Uh, I don't see how this bill uh, attacks that problem, and it's not the state's problem in the first place, because the Hawaii Constitution gives exclusive jurisdiction over the property tax to the counties. Uh, so we, we just not, don't understand uh, what this bill is doing and how it uh, tries to accomplish what it says it's going to accomplish. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Nicola Park from Clearway Energy and Support. 
Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Nicola Park with Clearway Energy. Clearway submitted written testimony in strong support of this bill. Um, just wanted to take the opportunity to emphasize that the intent of a payment in lieu tax program, if it was to be implemented by the counties, would not be to pay less in real property taxes for our renewable energy projects. Uh, rather, this bill would give each of the counties another potential option for creating long-term certainty on real property taxes for renewable energy projects. Greater certainty on real property taxes will ultimately result in lower prices for renewable energy and for ratepayers. Thank you for available to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, members, we also have written testimony in support from the City and County of Honolulu, the Department of Budget and Services, uh, City Councilman Calvin Say, uh, Hawaii Solar Energy Association, Ulupono Initiative, Long Road Energy, and two individuals also in support. Members, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 654. This is relating to buildings, requires state and county agencies to process the, the aggregated energy and water data of certain properties through the Federal Energy Star Portfolio Manager and submit the benchmarking data to the Hawaii State Energy Office. First to testify on this measure, we have Maria Tome from the Hawaii State Energy Office in support. We'll stand on our written testimony in support with Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Keith Reagan uh, from the Department uh, from DAGS in, in, with comments. Chair, Vice Chair, uh, members of the committee, Keith Regan, Comptroller for the State of Hawaii in the Department of Accounting and General Services. We stand on our written testimony providing comments on this measure. Mahalo. Thank you. Next we have Michael Chang, Hawaii, Hawaiian Electric with comments. Hello, it's Michael Chang from Hawaiian Electric. I'm here to support Lonnie in her uh, testimony, so I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Hawaiian uh, Kaiulani uh, Shinsato, Hawaiian Electric, uh, with comments. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. This is Kaiulani Shinsato here on behalf of Hawaiian Electric. We will stand on our written testimony providing comments and recommended revisions to the bill available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Caroline Carl, Hawaii Energy, in support. Aloha, Chair and Vice Chair, members of the committee. Chester Carson, on behalf of Caroline Carl and Hawaii Energy. Um, and we just stand on our written testimony in support and here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Matthew Geyer, uh, in support. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair. Uh, thank you for hearing this measure. I stand in support. Uh, making buildings more efficient will keep uh, more money in hawaii will make our environment cleaner safer and healthier for everyone so thank you for hearing and supporting this measure aloha thank you okay uh any other persons here to testify on this measure oh, go ahead thank you ted bolan on behalf of the climate protectors hawaii aloha chair nakashima vice chair sayama the climate protectors are strongly supporting this bill it is about building efficiency this is an initial stage where we're collecting data. We have a program from EPA which makes it easy to do so. So we're trying to find out what energy use and water use the buildings have. And once that's done, we can benchmark them and in the future be able to tell where we should best go in order to be more efficient. So this can save us all money. It's a good bill. I hope you'll approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, members, we have written testimony and support from the City and County of Honolulu, Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency, Board of Water Supply, Ulupono Initiative, Boma Hawaii, as well as several individuals with support testimony. Members, are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 54. Uh, this is relating to education, establishes a nationally certified school psychologist incentive program, appropriates funds for the incentive program. First to testify, we have Brenna Hashimoto uh, from Department of Human Resources Development with comments. Hello, Jeff, uh, Deputy here. Uh, we will stand on everything testimony and providing comments. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Keith Hayashi, Department of Education, in support. 
Aloha Chair Nakashima and Vice Chair Sayama, Annie Kalama, Office of Student Support Services, uh, providing testimony on, the, uh, on behalf of the Department of Education. We stand on our testimony, a written testimony in support of HB 54, HD 1. We're here for uh, to answer questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Leslie uh, Baunach uh, from the Hawaii Association of School Psychologists in Support. Hi, my name is Leslie Bonick with the Hawaii Association of School Psychologists. Uh, Aloha reps. Thank you so much for hearing our bill today. This has been a long-standing issue of shortages of school psychologists within the state of Hawaii. In addition, we have not done anything to remediate this problem. I have been in the state for 12 years and have seen nothing done to change this issue. Meanwhile, children's mental health has continued to be on the rise and so much more so now that we've had the COVID epidemic. We need highly qualified school psychologists and other mental health providers to serve Hawaii's keiki to meet these needs. The nationally recommended ratio for school psychologists is one school psychologist to every 500 students. We are at approximately one to 2,900, almost 3,000 on a given day. That means our students have to share one psychologist for five, six, seven, eight schools. This is not okay. National certification incentivization has been utilized for teachers and counselors already. We are not asking for more. We are just asking that you expand this to the other educators who are literally meeting the needs of Hawaii's most vulnerable keiki with special needs and mental health. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Alec uh, Maranti, uh, individual in support. Aloha, Honorable Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Alec Morantic. I'm a school psychologist on um, Hawaii Island, and I'm the um, president of the Hawaii Association of School Psychologists. Um, I stand on my written testimony, and I also want to highlight that the um, nationally certified school psychologist um, is the NCSP, as we call it, is awarded to um, school psychologists who meet the um, most rigorous standards of um, education as well as continued professional development um, based on the um, standards set forth by the National Association of School Psychologists. Um, and this includes um, 75 hours uh, minimum of continuing professional development every three years, um, which is one of the more rigorous um, uh, requirements compared to other similar national certification um, requirements. Um, by passing this legislation, it would support the um, Department of Education's ability to address recruitment and retention issues for school psychologists because it would make uh, wages more competitive, or sorry, more competitive um, with uh, national averages, which we lag behind currently. Um, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, members, we have supportive testimony from HGEA, a National Association of School Psychologists, HSTA, the Hawaii State Youth Commission, Hawaii Children's Action Network Speaks, and 19 individuals in support. Members, are there any questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, no, no, Representative. No, you go first. Okay. <laughs> Representative Onishi, go ahead. Uh, Office of Collective Bargaining. <laughs> Oh. I'm here in, uh, replacing our chief negotiator, oh. director. Yes. Jeez, I better ask you an easy question. Okay, good. <laughs> that's all. That's all I can answer. That's yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> so, do you have? Uh, well, can you tell us what is the average pay in Hawaii for school psychologists, and what is the average pay for school psychologists at the same level? within the western states? That I would have to defer to Department of Education. They have their own HR and their own salary uh, process. So DOE, uh, Department of Education would be able to give you those accurate numbers. Okay. Well, I, I thought because you had concerns about it being negotiable. Yeah, so for us is the that process. That would be yeah. a concern of yeah. yours. So the comments is uh, regarding the process where typically the process would be that they negotiate this out there and then we come to the legislature and ask for a specific amount so the concern we just wanted to highlight is that um, when we look in comparison to all psychologists um, if this is an issue that should be brought up 
as a collective bargaining issue. Okay, thank you. Chair, if I could ask, or Vice Chair, can I ask DOE? Go ahead. Similar question. So you heard my question to uh, Deputy Director Yamani. Do you guys have that information? We do know that our average pay is 64000 for school psychologists here in the state of Hawaii. I don't know how that compares to the national average. This bill seems to be not just certification, but because they get certified, they get more pay. Correct, incentivizing right? certification. So if we're already, if you don't know how it compares to other states, how can we compete for recruitment? Well, we know that, that um, it, it is one step to incentivize for that credential. Um, we're currently um, about 75% um, have 75 percent of our vacancies filled right now. So it is a recruitment issue. We know that um, the other option would be to increase salaries, which would be negotiable, right? This is an option for us to incentivize through the credentialing. Yeah, but I mean, even if you credential the person and the people and the other states are making more than what you're going to end up paying now, you're still going to have a shortage. Correct. What, what this also does, though, is it incentivizes those that are in the position already to um, um, stay if they get this um, particular certification. So it would assist with retention as well. Okay, so, but wouldn't repricing of school psychologists, given that they <coughs> need their pay increase, be also an incentive to retain and to recruit? Yes, that would be also an incentive. Repricing would be, okay. yes. Thank you. Okay. Question for DOE. Go ahead. Uh, there are a number of bills moving through this legislative session asking for funding for various mental health professionals, school psychologists, licensure. Does this certification process enable the psychologist that's in your schools to draw down on Medicaid funds? I'm not sure. Do you know, Ida? It does not require, it does not yeah, require currently, license. Um, Good afternoon, Ida Bonilla from School-Based Behavioral Health, Office of Student Support Services. Um, currently, the school psychologists are currently bringing in reimbursement through Medicaid through administrative supports. So we are already, they are already part of the administrative reimbursements. Okay, can you stay there? If there's the person from the School Psychologist Association, can you answer that question? Does this certification enable the school system to be able to draw down on Medicaid funds? Um, so this certification um, is, is a, it's a, it's a national certification. It is not the same thing as a um, credential. So um, without a credential, the Department of Ed can't bill our services for Medicaid. This is, um, the NCSP is similar to like the, um, the national certification that teachers can get through the teachers board. Does this national certification, do most teachers, or excuse me, most school psychologists who are, have this also have the licensure? And this is directed to the person who's in the school psychologist. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? For most school psychologists who have this national certification, do many of them have overlapping licensures? or is it not there it, it's 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 not um a it's not a dual licensure um there are two separate things um not all licensed school psychologists have their ncsp um but everywhere um but in the state of hawaii um there there are um uh, nationally certified school psychologists have a credential or license in some form the reason why i'm asking this and now i'm going to direct my comments and questions to the doe is that there's numerous asks for monies for different types of mental health specialists within the DOE system. And it seems to me that where the DOE may be putting its um, priorities in is actually not gonna draw down on those psychologists that we really need or those mental health workers that we really need. 
i.e. like school psychologists, like this program is, is looking to incentivize. So in your hierarchy of mental health professionals that you folks are trying to recruit, who are you trying to recruit? Um, currently, we're trying to recruit for all of our current positions, which would include clinical psychologists, school psychologists, behavioral health specialists, and social workers. And at the same time, you're asking for, in another bill, youth mental health workers. Is that correct? And where do they fall in the scale of the, the kind of um, skill set of all of these folks? Um, so through that bill, we are asking for behavioral health specialists. Okay. But would a school psychologist, in fact, be the highest kind of skilled set that we should be incentivizing when you go through that hierarchy of, of kind of behavioral health specialists? Um, when you consider the, so currently those positions fall under the school-based behavioral health program. And so each of those role groups actually take on a different support of the system. So our school-based behavioral health specialists are folks providing direct services to our youth. Our school psychologists are equip some of them to provide direct services but many of them support the systems at school and our assessments and the the school psychologists support that wider group of students correct because they're really like more like counselors they're helping from what it looks like the larger population within the within each school's system who's the audience that's being supported by the school psychologist in this bill so for the school psychologists, for the most part, they're supporting our school systems and offering supports within that school system for all of the students school-wide. They help the schools assist um, development of programs that are going to support promotion activities for mental health and well-being, as well as recognizing what kind of supports and services should be put in place if a student might be struggling um, so they can assist with plan development and things like that. Okay, so the broadest kind of population group then is what it sounds like, is what the school psychologists, these types of school psychologists are, are helping and assisting with. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for indulging in my questions. I just, this is a really important issue, uh, and we're attacking youth mental health in very uh, various forms, and this is actually a very important bill, so it's, I think, something that, it's surprising to me that OCB's testimony is what it is, but thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Representative Uh Any other members who have questions? Yeah. Chair, if I can have a follow-up. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, for the representative from the Hawaii Association of School Psychologists. Yes. Yeah, I, did you hear my questions prior about the salaries for yeah. Hawaii yeah. Yes. and uh, at least the Western states. Do you have any data on that? How we compare to other states in terms of pay? I do. So um, for one example from California, I don't have Western region averages, but the starting um, wage for school psychologists in California, as one example, is um, almost double what our starting rate is. Um, the national average um, for school psychologists in 2021 was 82,770 approximately. We also should talk about the fact that school psychologists are generally 10 month and in teachers unions in other states and in the state of Hawaii we are 12 month and, and have to work like the day after Thanksgiving through Christmas break etc. So even when you're comparing those national salaries you need to add about two to three months of extra work onto the Hawaii school psychologists that most mainland psychologists don't have to do. So this bill in the way that it's formed is that going to be an incentive for psychologists that are in Hawaii currently to keep them in Hawaii? Is it going to help the state recruit more psychologists that are needed at the pay level? Because we're talking uh, 5000 for certification and an additional 5000 so 10000 so we're talking 78000 a year uh, as their base pay for 12 months. Cut your thing, Alex, real quick. 
Um, yeah, so it, it's a start is all I have to say. I, I believe I wrote the draft of this bill first and got it introduced in 2016. So this is the eighth legislative session that this particular form of this bill has been in. So the, the, the gap when I originally wrote this bill wasn't quite that much, as you can imagine. Um, and the previous uh, HR uh, assistant soup, uh, I think it was uh, Cynthia Koval, she had actually said that most of us, because we receive a shortage differential, that's one way the department has been uh, supportive of school psychologists. They had reinstated it, but we found out again recently it's dropped back really low, which is really unfortunate. So the ones that are in the DOE are getting a, a brief sh or a small shortage differential that that makes it uh, a little bit more but it's still not great so we were looking at it at, at back in 2016 with with the shortage differential being reinstated and with the national certification bonus which would be more like the 10,000 that likely uh, it would be semi equitable but again it, it would be an equitable comparing a 12 month to a 9 to 10 month not on the annual. I, I do know that uh, several of the psychologists have said, you know, at least they'd acknowledge us, at least it would mean something. Um, and I always go back to school psychology has existed since 1896, but it's only existed in Hawaii since 1999. Um, so, I mean, that is a big reason of why this has been continuously problematic for us. Um, we are new. We are new to the game, right, um, in the state of Hawaii. Uh, and again, we're not trying to ask for stuff that everybody else doesn't have we're just trying to ask for what other educators already have yeah I, I fully understand that but you know I mean given the, the shortage of psychologists I mean having a fair comparative wage is important to recruiting people outside of Hawaii to come to Hawaii to work, I mean, and also given our high cost of living. So this would seem like, you know, you're only gonna tread water versus trying to address the real issue, which is trying to fulfill the number of positions that is actually needed to service the kids in our public education system. So have you guys attempted to do this, to try to get repriced? Yep, we have. We've, we, when I say we've tried everything, we have tried everything. We've met with HGEA. We actually met with HSTA to try to move over to them because then our wages would actually be more equitable if we were on the teacher salary, which is ironic because in most states we would make less being on the teacher scale. Um, we have tr met with the Department of Education several times. We've met with previous, gosh, what superintendent have I met with now? I have been at this for 12 years, sir. Yes, I have tried every single thing that you have said with no success. Um, and that is why in 2014, 15, 16, I started writing legislation for licensing school psychs as we we're the only state in the nation without a credential and, and in incentivizing and doing other things. And that's why we got the shortage differential back is because myself and another board member sat down with Kishimoto and she was kind enough at the time to reinstate our differential. So when I say we have tried everything, we have literally tried everything. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, members, any other questions? DOE. <coughs> um, it, it, so, school psychologist, does, a, does that job title exist anywhere else in the state? Yes, it does. Across so the nation. Wh where, where, what other departments have it? Across the state or across the states? Across the, I'm, I'm not sure if it, if it exists across other departments. Within the state, no. We're not allowed to exist in other departments because of the way the exemption in 465 is written, though we can work in early intervention in colleges and private schools in most other states. That's not afforded to us in the state of Hawaii. So are our school psychologists part of a bargaining unit in the DOE? They're part of contracts are not negotiated with the Department of Education. We're part of Unit 13 of HGEA, which is negotiated with the governor's office. Not anybody at the DOE is at the table for our contract negotiations, unfortunately. Okay. So, you know, I, I know that the DOE has been successful in the past of moving certain individuals up the salary scale. Has that been looked at? Uh, using department money 
There have been numerous discussions, as shared before, for various of various positions within the department in terms of re repricing. Um, so yes, that is a discussion or a conversation. Okay. Anyway, what's the last successful repricing? I can only think of what is in my office. We don't have Office of Talent Management here, um, but we did recently reprice, uh, I believe, our educational interpreters. Yeah, I think uh, on, uh, from the, I guess from the labor side, I'm concerned about um, granting repricing. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm concerned about granting repricing uh, legislatively. And so, you know, I would much prefer it be negotiated uh, with the bargaining unit. Uh, that being said, um, I I would uh, I guess encourage that we look at um, uh, reopening the negotiations with HGA to see if uh, there was anything possible uh, in terms of repricing, and then coming to the legislature for um, a Fulfillment of the of that obligation of the collectively bargained uh, obligation, as opposed to coming to us first. So that that would be uh, a recommendation I have for you to uh, take back to the department and mull over. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, we'll uh, communicate that with Dher. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 57 relating to workers' compensation, authorizes wages of other employees in comparable employment to be considered when computing the average weekly wages of an injured public board member, reserve police officer, police chaplain, reserve public safety law enforcement officer, sheriff's chaplain, volunteer firefighter, volunteer board enforcement officer, or volunteer conservation and resource enforcement officer clarifies computation of average weekly wages of an injured volunteer firefighter for workers' compensation benefits purposes. Uh, this is, uh, excuse me, HB 57 HD 1. Uh, to testify, we have uh, Jade Pate from the DLIR in support. Hello, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee, Joanne Fittenhar with the Department of Labor and we stand on our written testimony and support and available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, members, that's all we have for testimony. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB uh, 1241. This is relating to right of entry for professional surveyors authorizes professional land surveyors to enter any private property to perform land surveying subject to certain provisions regarding notice, identification, and liability. Shields land surveyors from prosecution under criminal trespass laws when performing their duties. First to testify, we have uh, the Attorney General's office uh, with comments. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Christopher Leong, Deputy Attorney General. Uh, you have our written testimony um, offering comments and some amendments to the wording of this bill. I just do want to briefly highlight, um, you know, at, up front in this testimony, uh, up front in this testimony, as we did in the written, um, that there is a concern that if this bill is enacted into law, it it does, you know, uh, raise a, a property right issue because it would. Uh, allow persons to enter the property of others without the consent of those others. Here it's the, the owners or occupiers of the adjoining lands in this bill. And so that is you know something that needs to be looked at. Um, that being said, y our testimony does go on to uh, offer specific written um, amendments, uh, which I'm not gonna go through all in detail, um, that would help to further effectuate the intent of this bill. Um, but with that, you know, I'm, I, um, uh, will be here and available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Meyer uh, Cummins uh, from the Hawaii Land Surveyors Association in support. 
Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Meyer Cummins. I am a land surveyor licensed to practice in the state of Hawaii. I'm also a director on the board of Hawaii of land, uh, excuse me, the Hawaii Land Surveyors Association, which represents the majority of the licensed land surveyors in the state. Uh, first, I stand by my testimony previously submitted in favor of this bill, a bill that grants a right of entry to surveyors without the consent of a land over owner, but subject to reasonable notice is necessary for land surveyors to do their jobs and protect private property interests. Understandably, there are some concerns that this right of entry bill amounts to a taking of property rights without just compensation. Indeed, the right to exclude one uh, is one of the most fundamental rights in our society. However, the bill does not grant a, bl a blanket right to the public at large to enter and occupy private property any time they wish without compensating the landowner. Such a right was found to be unconstitutional in the Kaisner Aetna case. Instead, this bill provides a temporary right to a discrete group of professionals licensed to perform surveys by the state to enter land, but only after providing the landowner with a minimum of five days notice. Despite those caveats, however, it is my understanding that the U.S. Supreme Court in uh, Cedar Point Nursery versus Hasid has recently deemed under most conditions that any invasion of land sanctioned by the government, whether temporary or not, will amount to a taking per se if the owner is not paid just compensation. However, the U.S. Supreme Court in that same decision left open the door when it stated that there will not be a taking where a government requires property owners to cede a right of access as a condition of receiving a certain benefit. That condition must be roughly proportional to the use of the benefit of property. Here, land surveyors are licensed by the government to inspect, correct, and maintain a stable and reliable private property regime to maximize the exercise of a landowner's private property rights and reduce litigation that may occur doing, uh, due to disputes arising from uh, boundary discrepancies. These are benefits for the private owner as well as society at large, and the benefits are proportional to the minimal access being granted to surveyors. Under this framework, a temporary right of entry for surveyors for the strict purpose of conducting a survey fall under the exception to the takings determination and should be permitted under the police powers of the state to benefit the safety and welfare of the community. Uh, therefore, I humbly request that you vote in favor of HB 1241 to protect the public interest and the land surveying community of professionals. Mahalo Nui for this op opportunity to testify. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Sheena Choi from the Board of Professional Engineers, Architects, Surveyors, and Landscape Architects with comments. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Sheena Choi, Executive Officer of the Board of Professional Engineers, Architects, Surveyors, and Landscape Architects. We would like to stand on our written testimony um, and are available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Joanne Williamson uh, from the Hawaii Land Surveyors Association in support. And we'll be moving on then. Next, we'll have Lindsay Garcia from the Hawaii Realtors uh, with comments. Sir, oh, would sorry. you like to come back to me or later? Uh, you know what, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you, sorry about that. Uh, this is Joanne Williamson. I'm a land surveyor in the state of Hawaii. I've been a land surveyor for over 30 years. I'm, I'm also on the board of directors of HLSA and the National Society of Professional Surveyors. I stand in strong support of this bill. Uh, there are, tw there are and for um, all the reasons Mr. Cummins mentioned, there are 26 other states that have similar legislation allowing sur professional surveyors the right of entry. Um, there is a link in my written testimony if you would like to see those, those um, legislative matters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Lindsay Garcia from Hawaii Realtors with comments. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members. My name is Lindsay Garcia from the Hawaii Association of Realtors. Uh, we have comments on this measure. We acknowledge the concerns raised by the AG. However, if the committee is inclined to pass the measure, we would respectfully request the land surveyor provide 10 days notice instead of five days notice in order to give the property owner ample notice and the opportunity to reschedule. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay. Uh, committee members, we have written testimony and support from several individuals as well as Action Survey LLC. Uh, and for other testimonies in written support. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, yes go ahead. Uh, this is for the Attorney General's Office. So with the uh, U.S. Constitution Fourth Amendment in mind, um, where does your office um, bear testimony? With the Fourth Amendment. So I'll, I'll read it, it's one paragraph. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, 
and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Well, I mean, respectfully, Rep, I, you know, the Fourth Amendment, you know, which I'm, sh I'm sure you know, is, is typically applied in a, in a criminal law context, right, in terms of criminal, um, you know, searches and seizures of, of persons or property. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I guess, I guess my answer is that I'm, I'm not really sure that it would have applicability to this bill. Um, I don't know if there's uh, um, any other related you know, question I could help you with. So let's say that we pass this bill, it becomes a law, mm -hmm. and then um, the surveyors ask the homeowners, can we survey your land? They say no. Mm -hmm. The surveyors go ahead and survey the land. Then the property owner sues the surveyors, mm -hmm. um, and then one of the lawyers cites the Fourth Amendment in the lawsuit. Do you have any commentary on that? Well, I, I again, um, same answer. I think same answer to your previous question. I, I don't think the Fourth Amendment would have applicability in that context. Um, I, I do see what you're saying in in the example. For example, this bill becomes law. Um, a property owner, you know, requests a land surveyor to come and do a survey, um, and and the survey may, uh, you know, in, well, obviously it's going to involve the property of the person asking for the survey, right, hiring the surveyor to do the survey, and may incidentally involve those adjoining neighboring lands. And if those adjoining neighboring land owners or occupiers, tenants, you know, don't give consent, that's, that's where the conflict, that's where the real conflict may come up, right? And so, uh, you know, they're, they're again, this all theoretically, they're, you know, if, if, if the neighboring owner decided to pursue a civil suit, you know, against the, that original landowner or against the state, um, you know, there are, you know, it, it would be, it would be in the form of a, of a civil um, suit and civil claims either against that landowner or against the government. But again, you know, we're, we're not talking about the, the Fourth Amendment, so I, I'm, I hope that it's answering your question. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, Vice Chair, uh, for the AG's office. Yes. So you heard the testimony of Mr. Cummings yes. and Ms. Williamson yes. in regards to uh, the Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. and also other states having laws to these effects. So are you familiar with those? So uh, let me, I guess let me kind of bifurcate my answer to that question, Rep. Um, you know, the... Um, Case law that uh, Mr. Cummins referenced was actually, you know, the case that we have in in the in the AG's testimony. So I am familiar with that case. That is, uh, you know, a takings, you know, property law case. What I'm not familiar with is um, the uh, citation that Ms. Williamson had included, and I, I myself only saw that, um, you know, before the hearing when all the testimony went up. So I would actually like to have an opportunity to um, review that law. I'm sorry, I can't answer that, you know, immediately, Rep. Onishi. So, I guess in the Supreme Court case, um, it, at the issue was whether or not the adjoining property owner got any benefit. Well, that well, it's not an exact match to to the you know the factual scenario of the bill. Um, if you want me to go into that case, rep, you know that that Cedar Point uh -huh. case. Um, it's a U.S. Supreme Court case. And it involved a California state statute that allowed um, people, um, and it was, it was specific, it's specifically targeted at agricultural land. And the intent of the bill was to allow, say, like um, you know, union representatives, organizers, to come onto that land. And and there were various um, you know notice provisions and all of that. But it it allowed those people to come onto you know these big agricultural properties to meet and to talk to the farm workers and so you know these owners and operators of the uh, agricultural property you know sued um, arguing that was a taking and the, the Supreme Court actually did agree with that and say that that was a you know taking of property that required th that a, s a state statute giving you know the third parties the right of access onto property even without consent um, w was a taking that would require just compensation but so there was a provision that as was uh, mentioned by mr. Cummings that unless you could prove that that property owner got a benefit right equal to the taking well 
you know that's that's not all i mean that's not always the case in takings law i'm if i'm you know. well would you then agree that the establishment of the boundary between two properties mm -hmm. benefits both property owners I think, it, I think that would, I think that would be fair to say right yes so but one property owner doesn't have to pay for it it's the person who's commissioning the survey who right. generally pays right 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 to get that property line established right and there could be all kinds of reasons why people don't know where that line is sure sure right sure so in this case would you be able to argue that the adjacent property owner got a benefit of delineating the exact property uh, boundary for them as well as for the person who commissioned the survey. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, it could be an in, you know an incidental benefit because I, I assume that the 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 owner of the adjoining property is not necessarily looking to um, you know get a survey have a survey done or have have the boundaries fixed right I mean the the focus is on the owner of that original property right who's yeah requesting so the survey say, say there was uh, inadvertent um, uh, 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 it like a like an entry encroachment right encroachment right that has been historical right and upon the survey finding out that the person who commissioned the survey mm -hmm. actually was encroaching on their neighbor. Hmm. That's a possibility. Wouldn't that be <laughs> a huge benefit for the neighbor? Probably. I mean, so yeah. you could argue that, that it's not a taking that's without mm -hmm. compensation. Oh, oh so, I mean, cer cer certainly, Raponishi, it's yeah. arguable both ways. Certainly, right. certainly, okay. yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you Thank you, uh, members. Any other questions? Go ahead. Well, so this question is for the, the land surveyors. Uh, yes, so uh, one of my concerns is that you know this may, maybe this would permit um, this would protect somebody from filing a lawsuit against uh, a trespassing claim. Do you have any um, commentary on that? Like, how often do people file lawsuits against land surveyors when this goes into effect? You know, so it's not a it's not a, a frequently occurring issue um, a lot of times surveyors can just sort of get away with a quick trespass but ultimately they're breaking the law at, um, every time they do occasionally it does happen so every year we have an annual conference of the licensed well all the surveyors from the state um, and we've been I know I've been personally asked by three separate surveyors um, to get some sort of right of entry or protection from trespass because they've been taken to court for you know trespass claims um, i'm not sure how those claims worked out um, and i'm not sure of the facts behind that but i do know that a lot of times landowners don't understand what it is that we're doing um, and what surveyors have to do is locate evidence to determine where a boundary is that usually requires us to sort of walk around and figure out where it is and many times we end up crisscrossing property lines um, so I don't know uh, how often it happens that someone gets dragged to court for trespass I'm just not privy to that information for all I know it happens very often um, but I do know that just in order to execute our duties we regularly trespass and we want to just make sure that our members are protected in case there is some landowner looking to you know enforce their property rights which they have um, and through some misunderstanding they end up suing the land surveyor when the land surveyor may or may not have been doing anything um, on towards just doing their job so um, I, I know that's not the best <laughs> answer to what you're looking for um, and, and I do want to uh, reiterate that this isn't something that frequently comes up but if it does come up and a surveyor is dragged to court, it can mean a lot of cost. Um, it might ruin their reputation. Um, it can mean losing jobs. It can mean dragging things out, you know, financial ramifications for the business itself. So in, in the course of surveying, we'd like surveyors to have some cover um, so that they can just do their jobs. And to, and to your question about the Fourth Amendment, um, if the concern is a surveyor entering a home, let's say, uh, generally speaking, we're 
concerned with the exterior boundaries, which are far away from the home. But I know other states have provisions that specifically and explicitly state surveyors have no right to enter a home, go to the cartilage of a home, for example, enter accessory buildings. Um, if that sort of language uh, can be inserted into this bill, we're happy to entertain that. Because again, our concern is not the home itself necessarily, unless there's, let's say, a boundary that runs through a house, which does occasionally happen, usually because surveyors didn't have enough information on the ground. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, we're not looking to enter any buildings or, you know, to that respect. Most of the time, we're just on the exterior. Um, one more point I want to bring up um, is that sometimes the issue is, is access. So if you're surveying a lot, that's up against a cliff, a pulley. And you cannot just jump down to get to the bottom where the boundary is actually determined to be. You've got to go around, which involves crossing other people's property. Um, usually, well, we always ask for consent. Usually we get it. But if we don't, let's say the owner is an absentee owner, we can't reach them, or they're, they're just obstinate. For whatever reason, that's fine. They have that right. We can't do the job for the client. Um, and ultimately, that affects their neighbors because all of these properties are connected like puzzle pieces. And in order for us to figure out where property A is, we usually have to know where all the property going down this way is, going down that way, behind and in front. That way we get a good determination. We get a lot of data to figure out exactly where the property is supposed to be. Yeah, yeah sorry. There's a lot of other questions I have, but I, I thank you for your responses. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, members, any other questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to the last bill, HB 1261. This is relating to special purpose digital currency licensure. It establishes a program for the licensure, regulation, and oversight of digital currency companies and appropriates monies. First uh, to testify, we have Iris Iketa from DCCA uh, in support. Aloha, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Ari Sakita. I'm the commissioner for the Division of Financial Institutions. So as you know, digital currency has grown in popularity and acceptance in the state nationwide and globally, but there's very little regulation over this particular industry. We did launch a, um, a research project called the Digital Currency Innovation Lab in 2020, and from that, we were able to design a um, regulatory scheme with the industry, which you have before, before you folks. Um, as you folks also are aware, there have been some recent failures of digital currency companies, and that this has illustrated the volatility of these units, how quickly a company can fail, and how consumers are left with really nothing of value. The strongest, um, the three strongest aspects of our licensure law is one, providing licensure requirements consistent with other industries, two, providing a minimum regulatory um, policies like anti-money laundering, cybersecurity, and privacy, which is all for consumer protection, and three, to require companies to maintain a strong financial standing, which kind of led to the downfall of all the previous companies. So we um, have suggested some amendments to this particular uh, measure. And with the amendments, we would like to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Len Higashi from the Hawaii Technology Development Developer Corporation in support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair. David Molinaro representing Len Higashi and the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. Uh, we are standing on the testimony as submitted. Thank you. Okay, are there any other persons in the room here to testify on this measure? Okay, uh, members, we also have written testimony from the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii with comments, Chamber of, Co Chamber of Progress with comments, and two individuals in support. Members, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be taking a short recess for decision making.
Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection uh, called back to order for decision making. Uh, first bill on the agenda is HB 16 related to liquor. Um, Chair's recommendation is that we pass this out with a defective date, June 30, 3000. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair. Uh, voting on as, H as amended. Okay. Voting on HB 16. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair, vote aye. Representative Mamato. Aye. Representative Bilotti. Aye. Representative Hasham. Aye. Representative Hussey Burdick. Aye. Representative Gates. Aye. Representative Lowen. Aye. Representative Onishi. Aye. Representative Tam. Aye. Representative Pierre. Aye. Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Hey, thank you very much, members. Uh, House Bill 17 related to liquor licenses. Uh, Chair's recommendation is that we also pass this out with a defect date, June 30, 3000. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 17, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments, noting the presence of all members. Any members voting with reservations? Voting no. Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. HB 596, related to intoxicating liquor. Uh, Chair's recommendation is we defer this. Uh, next. Chair, 159. 159. 159. Oh, 159. Oh, I'm sorry. I am sorry. House Bill 159. Um, Recommendations that we uh, move this forward with the Honolulu Liquor Commission amendments um, and defect dated June 30, 3000. Members, any questions or comments? Not members as amended. Voting on HB 159, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments, noting the presence of all members. Any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill. 596 related to intoxicating liquor. Chair's recommendation is that we defer this. Uh, next, HB 1084 related to liquor. Um, for the committee report, I'd like to note that this is uh, the effective date recommended by DOTAX is January 1st, 2024. For the purpose of the bill, uh, we'll defect date this June 30, uh, 3000. Oh, I'm sorry. You're deferring this. You're deferring this measure. 1084. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, HB 1084 uh, deferred. HB 1458 related to liquor licenses. Uh, Chair's recommendation we defect this June 30, 3000. Members, any questions or comments? Chair. Sure. Yeah, I just uh, am concerned that there was no justification made as to why um, they wanted these increases. And uh, I'd like for us to base these decisions upon uh, information and data. And, you know, having asked DOTAX to provide us uh, some database on taxes being collected, I think uh, would be. Uh, we would be able to make a better decision as to exactly how much uh, these increases should be if we're going to implement any. So with that, I'm going to be voting with reservations for now. Okay. Uh, Representative Onishi, is that House Bill 1084 you're talking about? No, 1450. Okay. Okay. 1458, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Any other comments, questions? Not uh, vice chair as amended. Okay, voting on HB fourteen fifty eight. Uh, chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments, noting the reservations vote from Representative Onishi. Anyone? Any other members voting with reservations? Any other members voting no? Thank you, chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, House Bill twenty four, House Draft one, related to other common carriers. Uh, chair's recommendation is that we defer this measure. House Bill 1029, uh, related to the use of electronic filing by the Public Utilities Commission. Um, the uh, Chair's recommendation is that we move this forward um, with uh, amendments uh, to make the bill uh, 
include, it, it, it's noted that uh, on page four, lines four to 18, page <coughs> seven, line 13 to 17, and page 11, uh, lines eight, uh, eight to 20, the uh, amendments on the three sections are electronic copies of documents. However, the uh, language will only be added to one of those sections, and we would like to make it consistent throughout the bill and add the um, amendment to all three sections. Other amendments for technical, uh, technical amendments needed for clarity, consistency, and style. Um, Chair's recommendations we also defect date this June 30, 3000. Members, any questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair, as amended. Voting on HB 1029, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments, knowing the presence of all members. Do any members vote no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay, thank you. HB 4, uh, 348, uh, relating to renewable energy, um, bill contains uh, defective effective date. Chair's recommendation is to pass this as is. Members, as is. Any questions? Seeing none, uh, Vice Chair, as is. Voting on HB 348, HD 1, Chair's recommendation is to vote as is. Noting the presence of all members, do any members vote no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill 654, House Draft 1, related to buildings. Um, this Chair's recommendation is that we move this forward with the uh, amendments recommended by the State Energy Office. Um, that uh, we do additional amendments for clarity, consistency, and style. Defect date the bill to June 30, 3000. And um, on line four, uh, page four, line five, apply to all buildings with more than 10,000 square feet. And um, committee report should <coughs> note uh, alternate values and date transparency information is not defined and other technical amendments for clarity, consistency, and style. Members, any questions or comments? Or yes, um, I'll be voting no because I believe that this could potentially um, cause the builders to spend more money um, to build the place and then cause the purchasers of it to have to spend more money to buy it. So, so I'll be voting no. Okay, thank you very much. Quick comment. Chair, uh, Representative thank Lowy. you for passing this bill that will help us save taxpayer dollars by implementing energy efficiency in uh, already existing state buildings and helping us understand the energy use of state buildings. Thank you, uh, Chair. Oh, wait, sorry, Representative Pierre, uh, you, you're referencing HB 654, is that correct? Yes. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any members, any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair, as amended. Chair's recommendation is to pass, uh, Chair's rec sorry, voting on HB 654, HD 1, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments, noting uh, the presence of all members and Representative Pierks, no vote. Any other members voting no? Any members voting reservations? Thank you, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, House Bill 54, related to education. Um, the bill does contain a blank appropriation and contains a defective effective date. Chair's recommendation passed this as is. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair, as is. Voting on HB 54, HD 1, Chair's recommendation is to pass as is. Noting the presence of all members. Any members voting no? No vote for Representative Purit. Any other members voting no? Any uh, uh, members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill 54, House Draft 1, related to workers' compensation. Uh, the bill does contain a, effect, a defective effective date. Uh, Chair's recommendation is pass this as is. Members, questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair, as is. Voting on HB 57, HD 1, Chair's recommendation is to pass as is, noting the presence of all members. Any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill 1241, um, 
Chair's recommendation is that uh, we adopt the AG's proposed amendments uh, that uh, notice shall be given 10 days prior to the intended entry and that uh, the definition of minor damages shall be less than $100. Members, any questions or comments? Yes. Um, I'll be voting no. I believe that this um, protects uh, one, as the surveyor said, a discrete group of individuals to trespass. And I believe that trespassing should be illegal for everybody equally. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll also be voting with reservations. Okay, thank you, Representative Omato. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, Vice Chair, uh, as amended. Voting on HB 1241, rec uh, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments, noting the no vote from Representative Pure. Uh, any other members voting no? Okay, noting the no vote, uh, sorry, reservations vote from Representative Amato. Any other members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill 1261 related to special purpose digital currency licensor. Uh, Chair's recommendation is that we adopt the DCCA amendments, other amendments for uh, technical amendments for clarity, consistency, and style. And um, that's it. Uh, members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Chair, uh, voting on HB 1261, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments, knowing the presence of all members. Any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much, members. We are adjourned.